Pilipinas ay may magagaling naman ni Mika, kula ni na Wanduna, Fernando Amarsolo, Boto Francisco at iba pa. Hindi ba kayo curious sa mga manilikha na nagmula sa iba't ibang parte ng mundo? Do you want to know how the art has progressed throughout the year? How different art styles has emerged through the different social political economy? Ano pa hinihintay mo? Tara na! Neoclassicism. Did you know that neoclassicism is an art style which started from the 1760s up until the 1950s? This took inspiration from the art styles of Greece and Rome in antiquity, which, according to Irwin 2023, invoked harmony, clarity, restraint, universality, and idealism. Erwin also referred to neoclassical art as the art inspired by antiquity but at a later time. Let's talk about the artists from the neoclassical period. So first one, let's have Jacques Louis Bouvier. So who is he? He was a French painter born on the 30th of August, 1748. He was well known for incorporating political issues in his artworks and he also served polarizing regimes like King Louis XVI, the post-French revolutionary government, and Napoleon Bonaparte. He also believed that a painter or an artist must be likened to a philosopher. Let's talk about one of the famous paintings of Jacques Louis de Ville, which is Napoleon Crossing the Alps. So let's talk about its history first. So this was painting on the 20th of May 1800s, and this was painted during the time when Napoleon Bonaparte has come to rise in power and declared himself as the first consul of France. So let's talk about the painting itself. So the painting shows Napoleon Bonaparte riding a horse on a steep mountain of Alps and he was leading his troop. So based on research, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was actually riding a mule instead of a horse. But Jacques Louis David did this to show the capabilities of Napoleon Bonaparte to lead France uh, amidst the chaos brought about by the post-revolutionary government. So, um, this painting helped Napoleon Bonaparte build a great reputation to the people. And this is also uh, a famous painting now, which makes Jacques Louis David successful to his goal. The Death of Socrates. This artwork was made year 1787. The artwork depicts Socrates, a Greek philosopher who courageously accepted his death because he was charged and executed by the Athenian court for his beliefs. Socrates stood his ground to his beliefs rather than renouncing his teachings to escape death. A painting with a classical background, David created this work during the pre-revolutionary period of France wherein the artist used Socrates' bravery to depict the essence of fighting for what you believe in rather than complying with unjust rulers. David was able to achieve his goal for this painting as it quickly, quickly gained recognition from, the, from various artists like John Boydell. The painting entitled Mars Disarmed by Venus and the Three Graces was made the year 1824. This was known as the last painting David created. It depicts Roman mythological subjects. It shows Venus, the goddess of love, seemingly crowning Mars, who is the god of war. Comparing this painting to his previous ones, this shows a theme that is rather contrasting. This artwork was painted during the time that David was exiled to Belgium a year before he died. During these years, people tended to appreciate and incorporate romanticism in their artworks. So there is an implication that David wanted to relieve neoclassicism in his final painting. It is a way to show how people can still adapt to a changing world.
Another neoclassical painter is Maria Anna Angelica Kaufmann, also known as Angelica Kaufmann. She was a Swiss painter who was born in Church, Switzerland in the year 1741 and sadly passed away in Rome, Italy in 1807. Kaufmann studied under her father, an Austrian painter named Joseph Johann Kaufmann, and she was hailed as a young prodigy. She was one of the two female artists who were among the first members of the Royal Academy in London, year 1768. She was regarded as a talented portrait, landscape, and decorative painter. Kaufman's pastoral and mythological compositions portray gods and goddesses. Also, her paintings are Rococo in tone and approach, though her figures are given neoclassical poses and draperies. Lastly, Kaufman's portraits of female theaters are among her finest works. Henrietta Laura Pulteney was an artwork made by Angelica Kaufman in the year 1777. It is a simple yet beautifully intensified painting of a young girl adventuring through the woods. In this painting, Henrietta, the young girl, can be thought of as an honor-meeting soul. Kaufman was able to create a lifelike portrait with a dainty background in, and detailed fabric of the dress and sash worn by the girl. Kaufman wanted to showcase as well the beauty of education with no kinds of restraints. Freedom and childhood were important themes during the time she created this piece of art. For the next artwork, let's have Self-Portrait, the artist hesitating between the art of music and painting, which was created by Kaufman in the year 1794. Now, in this artwork, she wanted to show her real-life experience during her youth years, wherein she had to make a decision between painting or music, because during her years, painting is considered as a nobler and a morally safer uh, profession for women as said by the priests. Now, this painting is also inspired by the classical tale Hercules at the Crossroads between Virtue and Vice. Now, in contrast with her male counterparts wherein they portray women as people who are weak and obedient, Angelica Kaufman wanted to instill a very feminist approach wherein women should be seen as people who are powerful and people who are empowered. Now, this painting was considered as unprecedented in the history of art, as said by the American art history professor Walter Dumer Hofer, because it portrays a female artist making important choices. Lastly, let's talk about the self-portrait of a lady which was created on the year 1775. Now, this painting is remarkable for its accurate use of tone, detail, and proportion. The unknown female sitter leans on a neoclassical plinth with a statue of Minerva who is a Roman goddess of wisdom. Now, this painting is also inspired by Minerva's victory over Neptune, depicting the artist's belief in women's powers. Now, this portrait attributes suggest the female was a female intellect possibly Catherine Makaulay or Elizabeth Montagu. This painting also endorses neoclassicism as it shows female decorum and celebrates the artistic skill of women. In addition, the table with lion's feet is a popular 18th century European art style by architects Robert Adam and Hosea Wedgwood. And finally, uh, the female lady and the artist was presented as equals travelers, curious, and artists. So for the last artist from the neoclassical period, let's have Jean-Auguste Dominique Angra. So he was also a French painter born on the 29th of August, 1780. He was well known for incorporating body distortions and nude subjects in his paintings and he was also a student of Jacques Louis David, who was the French painter we talked about earlier. Besides that, he was also well known for uh, incorporating the classical 
tradition of Raphael and Nicolas Poussin in his artworks and he also had a romanticism touch in it. Let's have the artworks created by Angra. First, let's have Oedipus and the Sphinx, which was created during the years 1808 to 1827. So in this artwork, we can see Oedipus confronting a Sphinx, which was making him answer a riddle. So this painting also shows the possible fate of Oedipus after answering the riddle because of the human remains and his friend from the background. Now, this painting was created during the time France experiences the post-revolutionary period. Angra wants to show the rise of human intelligence amidst a progressing society. The apotheosis of Homer was made in the year 1827. Ingress, a defender of the academic tradition, was commissioned to decorate a ceiling in the Louvre to demonstrate France's cultural superiority and reinforce in monarchy's le legitimacy. His apotheosis of Homer, a project of political and cultural legitimization, celebrates the lineage of classical thinkers and draws heavily from Raphael's School of Athens. The composition honors Homer as the originator of Western civilization with figures from the Western canon including Phidias, Socrates, Plato, and Alexander the Great. Ingress's hero and inspiration, Raphael, is dressed in a dark tunic, and a youthful figure is allegedly a portrait of the young Ingress himself. The apotheosis is a highly personalized, aesthetic manifesto that supports the reign of Charles X and strengthens Ingress's claim as the modern representative of this tradition and its deep cultural significance. In the year 1814, Le Grand Odalisque was made. It is a strikingly beautiful and eerily strange representation of the female nude, a tradition dating back to classical depictions of Aphrodite in ancient Greece. The painting features seniors lions and lavish space, adorned with lustrous fa fabrics and detailed jewels. His idealization of the human form is evident in the figure's twisted pose and out-of-proportion legs. Ingress's ability to merge elements of neoclassical linearity and romantic sensuality has provided a model for future avant-gardes and has become a flashpoint for discussions on the male gaze and female subject. With the artists of Romanticism, let us first define Romanticism. The period of Romanticism started roughly in the years 1798 until 1837. The state of economy and politics heavily influenced this period, wherein a lot of artists started gaining inspiration from the French Revolution. A lot of social changes happened during this period, wherein a lot of artists started voicing out their opinions. It can be said that Romanticism can be seen as a rejection of order, harmony, balance, and rationality. Let me introduce to you the first artist under Romanticism. He is Kaspar David Friedrich. Kaspar David Friedrich, a German artist, born on September 5, 1774. Friedrich was best remembered for his allegorical landscape artworks. He studied at the University of Griswold during his early years, where he was introduced to ideas around God and nature. He was passionate about showing the spirituality and divinity of creation. Now we will move on to the artwork of Friedrich. The first artwork is entitled Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog was created in the year 1818. It was created during a time in Europe where Romanticism was a prevailing art style. It was made during the times of the Napoleonic Wars and the French insurgency in Germany. Friedrich wanted to be able to invite and let the audience see the world through his eyes. 
It was an emotional portrayal of the vast infinity of emotions and soul. Second, we have Monk by the Sea. Monk by the Sea was created between the years 1808 and 1810. It depicts a monk standing on the shore, looking at the sea without a single ray of hope, and facing the ocean indefinitely. It was bought by Prince Frederick William when her mother, Queen Louise, died, and begged Napoleon who was occupying Prussia following his triumph to treat the Prussian people decently. The presence of her dad is certainly felt in the monk by the sea, though not in the monk's resolute figure. It is also a source of spiritual strength even to find stand. Like the Gothic monastery and the German oaks in its surroundings, maybe as much as a symbol of the nation's resistance against foreign military rule, as of the person confronted with his mortality. He wanted to reveal an individual's emotions during a period of uncertainty as well as to convey the infinite beauty of the world and the powerlessness of a man. The third and final artwork under Friedrich is the Abbey in the Oakwood. This poor David Friedrich began painting the Abbey in the Oakwood in 1809 and finished it in Friedrich's Abbey in the Oakwood is a ghastly masterwork that embodies the unappealing themes of the Nazism. It was created to show the loss of pride in the monuments of the German Gothic past, but were especially coming during Napoleonic rule. It was also painted and used by Friedrich as a medium to explore the human condition. The landscape takes on otherworldly implications and demonstrates how humanity is only one moment in the natural and eternal timescales. For the second artist of the Romanticism, he is known as one of the greatest painters and printmakers of the late 18th and early 19th centuries in Europe, none other than Francisco de Goya. He was born on March 30, 1746 in a small village in northern Spain. His early genre paintings are scenes from ordinary life were also influenced by a neoclassicism which was gaining popularity over a coco. He is regarded as one of the last of the old masters and one of the earliest of the modern artists. His works reflected contemporary upheavals and influenced important later artists. Let us discuss one of his most famous paintings, which is Saturn devouring the Sun. It was painted during the years 1819 to 1823 and influenced by the Napoleonic Wars, which created true moral and the social political atmosphere in Spain. This artwork portrays the fear and insanity about this dreary view of humanity that God himself experienced, especially during the time of war that brought change to his own country. The fear could be seen through Saturn's eyes with the help of the dark shades of the colors, bringing emphasis to the main subject. Second artwork by Francisco de Goya was titled The Third of May. It was painted in the year 1840 during the Napoleonic Wars, particularly the Peninsula War, that influenced Goya to create and commemorate the Spanish opposition to Napoleon's army through this piece. This artwork shed light upon the Spanish laborers who were about to be executed. Goya wanted to convey the emotions and turmoil which can be seen in their facial expressions and how the piece of light illuminated the victims, shadowing the faceless executioners. Famous for the early disturbing Saturn devouring the sun in the 3rd of May, Goya also created the nude Maha and the quilted Maha. The quilted Maha, also known as La Maha Vestida, was painted around 1800s and is based on his masterpiece, The Naked Maha or La Maha Desnudo, which was completed between 1797 and 1800s. The first nude painting of a female in Western art history, The Nude Maha, displays a naked woman reclining on a spread of pillows. Goya produced another picture from Atticism, La Maha Vestida, which depicts Maha with a strong and confident stare, peering directly into the eyes of the audience. Its primary goal is to show his defiance of tradition and antagonism to contemporary conventions 
as well as an expression of real appreciation for the feminine form free of societal constraints. Ferdinand Victor Eugene Delacroix was born in Charles de Saint Paris, France. He obtained his artistic studies in Paris and rose to prominence as a key figure of the 19th century French Romantic era. Delacroix is widely considered as the leader of the Romantic movement in 19th century French painting inspired by history, literature, and exotic settings. Delacroix's use of expressive brushstrokes and study of the optical effects of color profoundly shaped the artwork of the Impressionists, while his passion for the exotic inspired the artists of the Symbolist movement. Liberty Leading the People was painted in 1830 in commemoration of the July Revolution in France that deposed the restored Bourbon King from the throne. This painting was intended to serve as a political poster for the revolution with the hope that people would sympathize with the freedom fighters. The figure in the center known as Liberty is holding the French flag color. She is standing on top of a barricade which represents the struggle of the common people for freedom. In this painting, Delacroix created a more modern setting that contrasted with those of his competitors by mixing reality and idealism and using its distinctly expressive brushwork. This painting represents and emphasizes what a revolution feels like for the people involved. The Massacre at Taos was painted during the year 1824. Two years prior to the completion of the painting, the Greeks had been under the Turks for nearly four centuries. The island of Taos has its own ruling with the Sultan. That is why the revolt was an unfair and brutal attack. The Sultan found out about the revolt and sent troops to kill, rape, and enslave the inhabitants of the island. Delacroix wanted to convey and uncover the torture and suffering that the rebellions experienced. Although criticized for focusing on disaster rather than their glory, this artwork conveyed the message by simply observing the painting. Wherein at the bottom right, an infant can be seen touching his dead mother for survival. The Death of Sir Danapolis is one of the most spectacular paintings of Eugene Delacroix. The Death of Sir Danapolis was created in the year 1827 and was inspired from Lord Byron's 1821 tragic poem Sir Danapolis. His inspiration was also from Napoleon's victory in Egypt, wherein Egyptian themed objects can be seen, such as the Egyptian style hood worn by the Moors. Delacroix portrayed how the greediness of the king resulted in such tragedy. The king, who is surrounded by tragedy, and how his women, slaves, horses, and treasured concubines all died with his hands, wherein he may use Bigdan style which gives emphasis to the center of the painting to express how the king would rather destroy his own possessions rather than have them stolen. The realism art period originated in France during the mid-19th century. The realism is an art style that aims to represent nature and modern life in a detailed and unembellished way. It rejects idealization and instead focuses on a rigorous examination of outer manifestations, leading to many aesthetic currents being categorized as realism. So, in short, realism from the word itself, real. Realism is a true representation of our ordinary, daily life. Ludwig Henningsen was born on August 29, 1855 and died on November 28, 1930. He was a Danish painter and illustrator best known for his social realist depictions of underprivileged and vulnerable populations in the 1880s and 1890s. He joined Bogstaveliden, a platform for realists humanitarian, aims to better society via illumination and debate. Hennigsen was interested in the rights and living circumstances of groups, 
including the unemployed, women, workers, children, and the elderly in his paintings from the 1880s and 1890s. He frequently received requests to create historical and genre works. Today, many castles, manors, and museums around Europe use his paintings as decor in their hallways and apartments. Lastly, he was known for his ability to accurately depict reality while telling a story, and he took pride in remaining neutral to the subject matter without including any personal sentiments or philosophies. One of his artworks was named The Fire. It was created in 1901. In this piece of art, it can be seen that two young children are consoling one another on their safe bed as firemen struggle to put out the fire in a house in a rural village. Meanwhile, the mother stands behind her children and points accusingly at the older, well-dressed man who seems to be responsible for their predicament. On the other side of the street, observers from the rest of the block are standing back. Returning to social issues, Henningsen depicted this painting of a family leaving their possessions in the street as a result of the fire. The Evicted Tenants by Eric Henningsen was created during the year 1892. He was preoccupied with the rights and the living status of the unemployed, workers, women, elderly, and children. He joined the organization Boxtafeliden, a platform for the realists which aims to improve the society via knowledge and discussion as this was his goal for this artwork. A Wounded Workman by Eric Henningsen was created in the year 1895. Aristocrats and the landed class frequently held the positions of prime minister and cabinet member between 1865 to 1897. During that time, the dominance of the conservatives was based on better organization than before, the king's support, and a majority in the first chamber of parliament. Henningsen made a considerable effort to accurately portray each situation because he wanted to be as objective as possible in his artworks. So by the objectiveness to accurately portray what has been happening on the surroundings during that time, he has created this artwork. This painting shows a concern for the conditions of the poor and is somehow similar to what I've mentioned in the previous artwork. So this artwork or this painting portrays how life is for the people na walang posisyon sa paligid or sa gobyerno ng isang lugar. For our second artist, we have Alma Woodsy Thomas. Alma Woodsy Thomas is an African-American artist and a teacher from the Washington, D.C. and is now recognized as a major painter for the 20th century. Thomas is best known for her abstract and mosaic-like paintings, which are exuberant and colorful and were created after her retirement from a 35-year career of teaching art. In addition, she was also known to be the first black woman to have a solo art exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York during the year 1971. Her works were influenced by displays of azaleas, which she saw in the Washington, D.C. The Wind Dancing with Spring Flowers by Alma Woodsy Thomas was created during the year 1969. In an article released by the Hood Museum, this painting was inspired by the round-shaped formal gardens of Washington, D.C. She used colors to convey emotional content, but of course emphasized observation in her work. This painting portrays an imaginary bird's eye view looking down on concentric rings of flowers. Her goal in this painting was for this painting to serve as a gesture towards her response to what she was seeing, a visual approach to the poetic idea of illusion.
artwork created by Thomas that we are going to present was named Starry Night and the Astronauts. It was created in 1972. So this masterpiece depicts the wide open space and celestial patterns of a night sky. Yet, despite its narrative title, the painting might equally be viewed as an aerial perspective of a watery surface toying with our feeling of immersion inside an otherwise flat picture plane. Furthermore, the entire surface seems to shimmer, indicating the unfathomable beauty of space and arousing amazement similar to that experienced by many during the first space flights in the 1960s and 1970s. Since the late 1960s, the artist had been interested in space exploration, and in her later works, she frequently referred to America's manned Apollo moon landings. Thomas started painting as if she were on an airplane even though she had never flown, capturing what she called changing light patterns and streaks of color. Another artwork made by Thomas was named White Roses Sing and Sing. It was created in 1976. The natural environment is clearly evoked in this non-representational piece of art. Translucent white shapes appear to hover above a fluctuating green and yellow background. Instead of using bright, high keyed colors, Thomas prefers a mosaic-like pattern of pale shapes surrounded by a changing palette of verdant green and yellow. At a period when many other African-American painters were attempting to address social and racial themes through figuration and narrative, she turned to abstraction in her latter years. Thomas, on the other hand, drew inspiration from the colors and shapes found in nature. So in White Roses Sing and Sing, Thomas' abstract color and structure still evoke the natural world. Her artwork was inspired by local flora in Washington. proceed to our next artist. He is Gustav Kerbat, who was born on June 10, 1819 and died on December 31, 1877. He was a prominent French artist during the realist movement of the 19th century. He became extremely well known because of his paintings in the 1840s. His outstanding works made an effort to defy the rules at that time. Additionally, Kerbat was committed to showcasing his own artistic style and avoided using traditional art methods of that time. In fact, the Cubists and Impressionists drew inspiration from his unique techniques. The majority of his paintings also included less controversial themes like landscapes, still lifes, hunting scenes, and nudists. He thought that realism should depict the hardness and reality that happen in everyday events and is more focused on the rough handling of pigments. Kerbet established a unique kind of realism throughout his career, which served as a model to a number of other painters. Despite his struggles and difficulties throughout his life, Kerbet has in fact continued to serve as an inspiration to many. His brilliance and craftsmanship made him one of the most admired painters in history, and his legacy still resonates today. One of Kerbit's artworks was named The Artist Studio. It was created in 1855. Kerbit is seen working on the landscape painting while seated at his easel, accompanied by a white cat, a child, and a model for the artist. The scene is a view of the Lue River Valley close to Ornans, which was resolutely chosen as a representation of his provincial origins. The woman who is shown in a nude state is said to reflect the French Academy's traditionalism, or conversely, the artist's inspiration. She was naked because truth is represented by her. The white cat, which is the opposite color from the traditional good luck black cat, may represent Kerbet's anti-traditionalist viewpoint. The little child who is gazing up at the painter while he works is another of this section's most intriguing details. 
allegorical depictions of numerous influences on Kerbet's life and art may be seen in the other characters in the picture, which are separated into two groups, left and right. On the left, a depiction of ordinary French people from various social classes showcases the mundane aspects of everyday life. Kerbet's skill in classical art is also on full display. A buckled shoe, a plump cup, and a dagger are also visible on the left. These represent either the end of French Romanticism caused by the rise of Realism. On the other hand, a few of Kerbet's acquaintances, some of whom had a significant impact on his ideas and work, were able to be seen on the right side, in the dim background behind the artist. The artist's studio is an influential piece of contemporary art that reflects the changing relationship between town and country. The need for artists to understand the working environment of ordinary people and the role and value of art in contemporary political, social, and cultural contexts. Despite its classical tableau, it embodies Kerbet's lifelong devotion to societal philosophy and personal expression. The Burial at Ornans by Gustave Corbet was created in the year 1849 to 1850. This painting depicts the funeral of Corbet's great uncle, who is escorted to his last resting place by other citizens. This painting represents realism as it sticks to the facts of a real burial and avoids amplified spiritual connotations. Emphasizing the temporal nature of life, he intentionally did not let the light in the painting express the eternal. With that, the burial at Ornans function as a painting that raises the status of the everyday citizen to that of a monarch or god leveling social class. The Burial at Ornans by Gustave Corbet was created in the year 1849 to 1850. This painting depicts the funeral of Corbet's great uncle who is escorted to his last resting place by other citizens. This painting represents realism as it sticks to the facts of a real burial and avoids amplified spiritual connotations. Emphasizing the temporal nature of life, he intentionally did not let the light in the painting express the eternal. With that, the burial at Ornans function as a painting that raises the status of the everyday citizen to that of a monarch or god leveling social class. last artist for realism was Jean-Francois Millet, who was born on October 4, 1814 and died on January 20, 1875. He was a French painter known for his depictions of peasants in rural settings and the religious themes that sometimes accompanied them. Additionally, he saw his fair share of accomplishments and setbacks when it came to the public and critics. With France, political situation being so chaotic, people were extremely class conscious and viewed anybody who celebrated the nobility of the peasant class with distrust. However, his beliefs, naturalism, and a romanticized imagery helped build the groundwork for following contemporary painting movements and over time he rose to prominence in the art world. Since many following painters, photographers, and authors look up to Millet as an inspiration, mentor, and friend, his work had a significant influence on their techniques. One of Millet's famous works was named The Angelus. It was created in 1859. In this piece of art, a man and a woman are standing in a field. They are farmers. The woman was wearing a long blue apron over her dress and a white hat, clasped her hands with a prayerful expression on her face, while the man stands with his head down and clutches his cup solemnly. Near the conclusion of the workday, they take a moment for prayer. Mie captures a scene of the common spirituality of peasant life in the late 19th century. 
where religion permits both daily life and labor. Additionally, it draws inspiration from a personal experience of his from his time growing up in Normandy. He spent a lot of time working in the fields. Although Mie never specifically addressed social judgment, the Angelus may also have political and social implications. It displays empathy and sympathy with the working class by representing the challenging working conditions of the masses. The Sheepfold Moonlight by Jean Franco Amile was created in 1853. This depicts a solitary shepherd at work on the plains. This painting was created to show the reality of the hard life that many people lived. In this nocturnal scene, the waning moon throws a mysterious light across the plain, extending between the villages of Barbizon and Cali. Millet was recorded as saying of the solitary shepherd, Oh, how I wish I could make those who see my work feel the splendors and terrors of the night. One ought to be able to make the people hear the songs, the silences, and the murmurings of the air. The Sheepfold Moonlight by Jean Franco Amile was created in 1853. This depicts a solitary shepherd at work on the plains. This painting was created to show the reality of the hard life that many people lived. In this nocturnal scene, the waning moon throws a mysterious light across the plain, extending between the villages of Barbizon and Cali. Millet was recorded as saying of the solitary shepherd, Oh, how I wish I could make those who see my work feel the splendors and terrors of the night. One ought to be able to make the people hear the songs, the silences, and the murmurings of the air. but very informative take on the three aforementioned art styles, which are neoclassicism, romanticism, and Latin realism. Thank you for sparing your time listening to us. Till next time, bye!